everyone, and welcome to Emotional Grit, the podcast where you can learn about the power of perspective and the science that fuels us. I'm your host, Jennifer Fernjack, and my YouTube channel is also called Emotional Grit, so please feel free to like and subscribe to the podcast so you can enjoy this episode along with others. I'm happy to say that today's guest is Shelly Clevis. She had a traumatic brain injury uh, that happened back, it was actually almost 15 years ago, and since then, she has helped other people um, around the country and through that has adapted to her new normal and is here today to share stories. So Shelly, let's get started. So uh, it's my understanding that nearly 15 years ago, you were traveling in Europe for work uh, when the actual accident happened. So um, what were you doing in Europe for work uh, before the accident even happened? Well, actually, I was just thinking it's been, um, I was in corporate America uh, for 15 years and I was starting, you know, about a year before I flew to Amsterdam, I was starting to feel uncomfortable in corporate America and wanting to do something different, maybe in the nonprofit. So I was getting this itch to do something different. And I don't know if my company realized that, but they said, Shelly, how about you do a six month project for us in Amsterdam? And I, I was thinking to myself, okay, I'll do a six month project in Amsterdam and then I'll definitely do something different or I'll look for different opportunities. And so I was coming off a couple of other different projects, but I flew into Amsterdam and they had me, uh, they had a condo for me and I got all situated and everybody there rides their bike. So I was determined to get a bike and commute to um, the place I was going to work for six months. And actually it's funny because uh, the Sunday before my project was going to start, um, I had done a test run with my bike and I had put a post on Facebook. Okay, it's gonna take me 35 minutes each way, blah, 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 you know? And so, but then that Monday morning, I got up and was doing this commute and I came up to a tram track and I looked left and there was nothing coming. And I looked right and there was a tram coming. So as we all do, we were just, I was waiting for the tram to pass on the right. And as it passed, I stepped out, but there was one coming behind it, from behind it, around the corner. And so as soon as I stepped out, I got hit. And um, I was fortunate that it was only 15 minutes away. Within 15 minutes, they got me to the hospital and regulated the pressure in my brain. Do, and, you, do, you, do you remember being hit? Or do you remember like what you thought when you first saw that it was just so many feet away? Or did you literally have like no idea what hit you? Yeah, no, I have no idea what hit me because they say about two weeks before your accident and two weeks after, you don't have much memory. Okay, so um, and do you know was it was it like a good Samaritan who found you, or or were there just people around who happened to call the authorities? Well, I, don't, I don't know exactly who it was, but it was a tram, so I don't know if it was the driver or someone on the tram or someone that was at this, you know where I was before the, I have no idea who. Okay. So you're taken to the hospital and what happened next? Well, uh, the other fortunate thing is my parents were scheduled to arrive to visit me the next day. And my company called them and said what had happened and they flew them out a day early. So basically very close to when I arrived at the hospital, my parents were there with me. Um, and so I'm sorry, what did you say the question was? Oh, and so oh, I just, was just, for, yeah. oh, just as far as you get to the hospital and then what happened next? Okay. Well, so for the next month, they had me on a stint machine regulating the pressure in my brain. So I was hooked up to tubes. My hair was, sh my head was shaved. Um, and I stayed on this, uh, machine and they would periodically turn the machine down and my brain pressure would go up. So they'd turn the machine back on. And so after, um, and my parents were there the whole time. So as we were approaching a month, my dad was talking to people saying, okay, are you gonna put a permanent stint in her head because we can't be here forever? And they said, yeah. And so they scheduled a surgery to put a permanent stint in my head, but they kept checking the machine. And uh, a day before my scheduled surgery, they turned the machine down and I took care of it myself. So I feel that was God saying, okay, it's time to move on. Wow. Wow. I can see that. 
So you mentioned your parents obviously being there. I mean, have they told you just kind of like what they were thinking or how? I mean, I can't even fathom being a parent and watching yeah. your child with tubes and your head partially shaved and just yeah. knowing what's going on and the pressure on your head. Have they shared with you just what that experience was like for them? Oh, definitely. And I was in an induced coma, but they, and when they flew over, they were talking and saying, well, what if she dies? What, how are we going to get her home? What are we going to do? Because again, this is Amsterdam. And so they were really thinking what would happen if she died, dies. But then also there's so many unknowns. And so the only thing the medical team could tell them is when I had stabilized, so they knew I wasn't going to die immediately, but they had no idea what the outcome would be. And they said, maybe you'll have to keep her in a nursing home or, I mean, they had no idea. And so it was, it was frightening for them. And it, it taught me that so many emotional caregivers go through an not equal, but a traumatic experience as well, because they don't know how to handle this new person that can't do anything or doesn't know things or things like that. Yeah, it's almost like you were kind of a shell of your former self. You know, exactly. like you were you, you were still there physically, but as far as mentally and emotionally and psychologically, it was a new normal. Absolutely. And I always felt like it added, I was 38 at the time, and it added 40 years onto my life. And so as I was recovering along those years, I kept getting younger as I kept aging. So basically my 40s are pretty much a wash. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah. So like when you say getting younger, like what, what would be kind of an example of that? Well, I mean, just as my major improvements, like so many people with traumatic brain injury aren't able to live on their own, but I was able to live on my own. So that was getting younger. And, um, and then, you know, even doing more things than just one thing at a time or, uh, Walking. I mean, there's just so many ways that you become more of a person again and more of who you were, although that's a very long process to become who you were. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, did you wake up um, in Amsterdam or was it more are your first memories when you got to the States as far as realizing where you are and that something had happened to you? Like, Did you have any clue when you were in Amsterdam what had, what had happened and where you were? Well, actually, um, and I, from seeing pictures, my parents had signs above my bed, you are fine, your name is Shelly. I mean, they had things, you know, kind of, if I would have woke up and, and looked at them. But I think I was really in an um, induced coma while I was on this stint machine. And so when they took me off the stint machine, I left shortly after that, but I do have one memory um, that I don't know if for sure it's true or not, but all my coworkers in Amsterdam were around my bed and I was holding someone's hand. And then someone said, well, I got to get going. And then I thought, oh, I better hold his hand before he leaves. And so then I held his hand and then someone else said, yeah, and I got to get going too. And so I was like, okay, you know, so I was all focused on holding their hand before they would leave. And so that sounds kind of like me. So I'm pretty sure it happened, but I don't know for sure. I could see that. <laughs> so um, who made the decision as far as when it was time for you to leave Amsterdam and, and head to the U.S.? Well, they definitely wanted me um, off the stint machine. So that was really the, the um, act that they were waiting for. Because okay. otherwise, I was had, had to be kept in a, an induced coma with this um, stint machine in my head. Okay. So, and how did you get to the U.S.? Was it like some kind of a private plane or or how did you how did you even get here? <laughs> Shortly after my accident, I used to call it an emergency taxi. <laughs> it was an emergency taxi. It was a it was a charter plane that that um, because basically um, I had. The, my companies were merging, so it was also difficult to see who was going to pay for what. But but some of my insurance or something came up with a um, a small plane that flew me 
to Rochester, Minnesota, which was close to where I grew up and where the Mayo Clinic is. And so then I was in the Mayo Clinic for two months. Wow. Okay. So people with, with this with this kind of a thing, as far as like the, the trauma of the actual accident, and of course the, the stint and different things, we'll think about the physicality of what happened to you. But as I alluded to earlier, there's also the emotion of it and things like that. How did you kind of emotionally uh, deal with this? Was it was it a matter of a denial initially, or or did you kind of have to initially think, you know what, I've got to persevere, I've got to, you know, move forward? I mean, do, do you remember just kind of what your thoughts were and how they impacted your emotions? Yeah, well, it was kind of a mixed bag. I um because part of me was so um, depressed that I. I basically lost my whole self and I was, a, a, you were saying the new normal, I was basically a new person. And so that was part of it. And then, and then because of all my family, I had a great family and friends support. So there was in no way that I wanted to disappoint them and commit suicide or something like that. Yeah. But if someone would ask me, are you wish the tram would have taken you out? I was like, yeah, I wish the tram would taken me out because this is not fun this is horrible right. and even though um when people would say how are you i'd be like i'm, I'm walking forward i'm moving forward yeah. and that's all i could do and right. um so that was a big part was there was there a pivotal moment or just kind of a slow process as far as having you get out of your depression um as it you know as it relates to these kinds of things and uh just kind of accept it's kind of that dichotomy of hoping for continued healing, but then also having to um, adjust and accept your new normal. You know, it's kind of that, yes. you know, so was there like a pivotal moment where you kind of realized that, you know what, this is my new normal. I'm going to, to your point, try to move forward. Or was it just kind of a slow over time, things got easier? It was a little bit of a slow, I had a psychiatrist initially too at the hospital and they, the psychiatrist said, you aren't someone who would typically suffer from depression, but I think a uh, depressive medication would help you. And so I went on it and at what, some point when I started feeling like I was getting back to a new normal, um, I thought of weaning off it, but when I weaned off it, I just didn't have the determination to keep going and look for new opportunities. And so I thought that's what I need. And so I went back on it. Um, recognizing, okay, the psychiatrist said I wasn't a person that would be typically subject to depression, but this, this traumatic brain injury provided other reasons why I needed to be on it. So I could see that. Well, and one thing that I've heard from people over the years who have a traumatic brain injury, or it's also called the TBI, Mm -hmm. is people will say that, you know, I wish I had some kind of a crutch or a cast or a cane, like something tangible. That way people yes. would know to cut them some slack. Whereas Absolutely. with a brain in, with, a, with a brain injury, it's 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 hidden. I mean, it's it's in here. People can't tell. And so okay. I know there, there was one person I had met uh, a number of years ago who talked about how now she has a sensitivity to light. So whenever she goes mm -hmm. into Target, those blaring lights, you know, that are in there um, hurt her head. So she wears sunglasses. And living yes. here in Minnesota, as you can imagine, in the middle of the winter, you know, most people aren't wearing sunglasses. So people give yes. her funny looks, kind of like, why are you wearing sunglasses? It's the middle of February. What are you doing? Well, it's she has a traumatic brain injury and the light hurts her eyes. Yeah. Um, so it's just people don't realize that. So I'm wondering for you, with your experience with a traumatic brain injury, um, what were some of your symptoms and different things that people just couldn't see, but you were experiencing them? Well, you bring up a good point because that really bothered me that people couldn't see, especially in my case, I had improved so much that people was like, I couldn't even tell. And sure, part of me was like, okay, well, that's nice that you couldn't tell, but the downside is you can't tell, you yeah. know? And so um, the last that's thing- That's so impact, true. I know the last so thing impacts is I have um, in my right eye, um, the down nerve was damaged. So I have a blind spot in my right eye that continues. Um, my left knee was uh, needed um, rods in there to sustain my left knee. And so my left leg always isn't as strong as my right leg. And um, as when right after the accident, my um, right hand was elbowed up because I think I was hit on the left and fell on the right. And so for 
at least a year, I couldn't move my arm down to my side. And so as a result, I'd always use my left hand and I'm really right handed. And so people, I get my nails done and people manicure said, I can't tell if you're right handed or left handed because I had done so much with my left hand then that in my recovery that they're, I don't, they became similar. That's interesting. I suppose you may, maybe you built up the muscles or something in your yeah. left hand. And so yeah. it's harder to tell. Um, now, cognitively, um, has it been more of a challenge as far as like trying to read something and comprehend it or make decisions when there's more than one option or what, what kinds of things cognitively um, have you experienced? Well, a big thing with traumatic brain injury is the inability to multitask. Okay. And so that's gotten better for me. However, it was more important to just do one thing at a time and not do multiple things at multiple times. Um, and there was something else I was going to say. Um, oh, as far as like comprehension, maybe like if you're, if oh, you're reading yeah. something. But, or... but what I would do as a therapy, I would say is I would normally cook and do, cause that would help the multitasking. And then I also was a big reader. And so I would always force myself to read at least you know, two hours a day because it was a love of mine. But then also um, I saw it as a, a therapy and um, it was difficult. And, and I was only really able to read. It was hard for me to read two hours at a time, but I was like, no, I'm going to go have coffee and sit here for two hours. Um, but it's so funny because the other thing with TBI is they say after five years, you really won't improve anymore. And I've improved so much more since my five years. And even wow. just recently, just a, a month ago, a couple months ago, I now am able to read for longer than two hours. I, you know, can read three, four, five hours a day if I have the time, obviously. Wow, and, that's interesting. Uh, so it's, you see improvements all the time. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting how just little things in everyday life, it's easy, it's easy to take them for granted until you can't do it or have a hard time doing it. So yes. I know um, yeah. for me, for example, um, I don't have a traumatic brain injury, but I did have surgery for a brain tumor <laughs> and um, the size of a golf ball, you know, and the tumor was technically outside the brain, but in the, in the lining of it. And so when I had my surgery, the surgeon literally cut down my face that way he could get in there. And as part of doing that, he had to cut through nerves and things. And so I was warned before surgery, you know what, I might have a hard time smiling, which thankfully I don't. I mean, I, I'm an auditor for a living. <laughs> and so it's like, it's, 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 it's hard enough. I know people don't even want me in their offices. And so I'm, I'm very grateful that I can still smile and look friendly. Um, I was also told that I may, I may have a hard time yawning because you open up your mouth and extend those muscles. But thankfully, I can still yawn okay. Uh, there's just different things that people, again, take for granted until mm -hmm. all of a sudden your life changes. And I've also heard about people who have had strokes, who've had to learn how to eat again. Um, things just, again, little things that um, now I know for me personally, uh, it's a small victory. I might think, yeah, I can smile. And I'm sure most yeah. people are thinking, you can smile, who cares? And I'm like, no, you don't get it. I can smile. Exactly. Um, you know, and uh, I remember uh, you and I had met some people with uh, traumatic brain injuries a number of years ago, one of whom was someone who talked about how he had climbed a uh, ladder. I think it might've been to change a light bulb or something. I, I forget what it was, but he wasn't wearing shoes. And so he slipped on the ladder and then got his traumatic brain injury. And one of the, th uh, the things that really plagued him after that was that it was guilt. I mean, he kept thinking, oh, if I had just been wearing shoes, my, my footing would have been more secure and I wouldn't have this brain injury. And he was just, he was just very mad at himself. And a number of years into this, he, con he contemplated suicide. But then one day he was looking outside of his window of his home and he saw his elderly neighbor uh, who was trying to get groceries out of her car and into her house. And she was struggling doing that. And so he decided to put on his shoes, go outside, and he helped her carry her groceries. And by doing that act of kindness, it gave him a sense of purpose. And um, since then, I have learned that when you do an act of kindness for someone, it can actually lower stress hormones and influence the feel-good chemicals of the brain. It's, it's called a helper's high. But okay. since then, he, he also has done things like he'll, he'll shovel, shovel for people and do it anonymously. Like just grab, grab a shovel and go shovel their sidewalk yeah. or he'll mow someone's lawn or that kind of thing. But it is interesting how uh, with, with some kind of a traumatic brain injury, it can affect people differently depending on where it is. 
you know, Absolutely. and as far as how you react to it, that can make a difference in how you move forward. So pretty amazing stuff. But um, are there other people who you've met who also have a traumatic brain injury where they've had certain symptoms they've had to overcome and, and just learning like how they've been able to do so? Well, I know um, that a lot of people that have a TBI lose their sense of taste. And again, I didn't, but I'm so, and I'm so grateful I didn't, but a lot of people lose their sense of taste. So they, um, they have to eat to live, but everything tastes the same. And that's so interesting. That's one thing. Yeah. And so, um, oh, and everybody's just so different. And so that's just one thing that came to mind. Yeah. You know, there was somebody else I met and I forget what the condition is called, but she got in a car accident and now has a traumatic brain injury. And so her brain has a hard time processing music because it can't process the keyboard over the drums, over the guitar, over the bass and different things like that. So a few years into her traumatic brain injury, she was watching TV and there happened to be a ketchup commercial. And as the ketchup bottle is tilted and the ketchup's coming out of it, there was the sound of a single saxophone and all of a sudden she could hear it and her eyes filled with tears. She was like, I can hear it. I can hear it. Well, it's because her brain could hear a single instrument. It just can't hear in instruments like different instruments all at the same time. So now she has this like renewed like lease on life and she's gone onto mm -hmm. iTunes and she's downloaded songs where literally it's a single instrument, but, but it's given her a sense of hope because she can actually hear music again. So it's just fascinating how the brain works, <laughs> you know? So complicated. It's really so complicated. It yes. just gave, it's given me a, an appreciation for our brains because they're so yeah. amazing. Really. Yeah. Well, and have you ever heard of uh, foreign accent syndrome? It's like an actual thing um, where, uh, for example, I, and you can Google this, there's a woman in Canada who fell off of a horse and now she speaks with, with sounds almost like a Scottish accent. And there are other people, it's, it's a very rare thing. Um, there was an actress named uh, Mary Lou Henner. Uh, I think she may have been on a TV show in the 70s. I think it might've been called Taxi with Danny DeVito. But, yeah. um, I, and I believe that she has this as well. But, um, but yeah, oh, and actually in hers, Hers might be not so much the foreign accent syndrome. I think hers is actually one where she has something with her brain where she can't forget things. And uh, so I'm getting I'm getting her condition mixed up. But with her situation, um, you would think, oh, you can't forget things. I bet you studying for tests was easy and I bet you doing your job was easy. Well, yeah, I'm sure it helped with probably memorizing scripts and things like that. However, imagine going through breakups over the years. And you can't you can't get over the person because you can't forget how you were feeling at that moment or what they did to you. Uh, there's also a downside. Um, so yeah, so whether it's foreign accent syndrome, which I said is actually a thing, um, or or this scenario where people um, uh, can't forget stuff, the brain is just fascinating, you know. But now with your with your condition and what's happened, I know that uh, you used to try to help others through like a, a, a traumatic brain injury support group. And every year in Minnesota, I know that there's a, an annual walk for uh, raising money for traumatic brain injury uh, research. Are there other types of things that you've gotten involved with as well, as far as uh, trying to reach out to others and, and pay forward what you've learned? Well, um, the traumatic brain injury was a great thing. And then plus we still have a Facebook page. So if anyone ever um, sends a message on Facebook, will reach out and um, see over the last four years, I've been a little more disconnected from um, people in my realm of traumatic brain injury, which is in some ways unfortunate, but I can also, oh, bless you, bless you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but I could see myself doing that in the future because I've always seen um, myself possibly um, starting some support group wherever I am, even if it's online, just being available for, um, like I said, people to ask questions or understand things better um, from yeah. someone who's experienced it. When you were uh, kind enough to let me interview you for the book that I wrote, uh, yes. which uh, went to print two years ago, but uh, one of the stories you had shared is how uh, there have been times you've gone to a hospital, I believe in, in California, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. but, yes. um, and just being able to help people and in doing so realizing that 
you don't have to always make conversation with them if they're in a hospital bed. I mean, sometimes it's actually overwhelming to try to even make small talk. Instead, yeah. it's just more having a, a sense of presence in the room. So could you please describe that for listeners as far as like what you would do? Absolutely. And that was five years after my accident. So it was um, t- about 10 years ago. But I had this dream of helping people. And so at Desert Regional, they had an acute rehab area. And I asked them if I could come in and just meet with patients um, and let them know I had a traumatic brain injury and see if they had any questions. And it turns out that when I would go visit them, they had just gotten done with some physical rehab. So they were so tired and just wanted to sleep. And so I had gone into this woman's room and said, said my name and said I was also recovering from a traumatic brain injury. And I said, and so if you have any questions, I can be sure to help you. And so she was silent and then she just started moving around. And I, and I remember being in the hospital and people coming in to visit me and wanting to talk and, and have me answer questions that I was, I would get so uncomfortable. And so I said to her, I said, you know what, you don't have to ask me any questions. Can I just sit with you? And that seemed to put her at ease because then she could rest, which she needed the most. And I could just be with her. And it was helpful for if there were people there that they could take a break or a lot of times there weren't any other people. So it's just giving people a visitor and just being present. Being present is key because even if you were just sitting there reading a book while they're sleeping, just to wake up and know that you're there. I mean, that you're because you you could be anywhere. You could have been at a party. You could have been at a restaurant. You could have been anywhere, but you were, you were there by choice. Um, and trying to provide comfort to someone. And there's a lot to be said for that. Um, I, I know that uh, there was a, a person I met through work a number of years ago who lives out on the Chapel Hill, Hill part of, I think it's North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. But he um, gets permission from a local nursing home to go sit with uh, elderly people, either after they've had some kind of a surgery, or perhaps maybe they were expecting their adult children to come visit, but the kids couldn't make it. And now they feel lonely I and mean, that kind of thing. And he literally would then get permission then from the individual uh, residents as well to go sit by their bed. And it might be that he sits there and holds their hand, or it might be that he's there and, uh, and just, it it could be small talk if that's what they want. But again, just being present can carry so much weight, um, even in scenarios like that, where they're not necessarily long-term friends or that kind of thing, you know, but now if you were to give yourself advice as far as, you know, going back almost 15 years ago, because obviously initially you were in a coma, <laughs> but, 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 you know, but as far as after that, uh, if you were to go back now and give yourself some advice with the gift of hindsight, um, is there anything that you would perhaps do differently? Is there any, is there anything that you know now that you wish you that you'd known then? Um, you know, nothing comes to mind initially, not because I'm perfect and I do everything right, but because obviously there's <laughs> trials along the way, um, but that the importance of just to keep going and mm. this long-term resilience um, to fight against a tragedy that needed a lot of emotional grit, like you say. And so um, just to keep going, because I know people get so depressed and they don't want to do anything. And yes, in my case, the depression medication helped that, but just keep moving and And sometimes, I mean, like for the first four years of my accident, I was just moving forward. That was all I could do. And, but I, something, so. Well, and to your point earlier, it's also important that caregivers uh, are are acknowledged as well. And then we also have a third category, and that would be people with traumatic brain injuries uh, who are the caregivers themselves? Yes. <laughs> so yes. it, it might be that someone has a traumatic brain injury, but they're also a parent, <laughs> and so um, their their kids might have certain expectations of them, not knowing that there's something going on in here, and mm. um, you know, and then you're trying to do the caregiving stuff when you yourself should be taken care of. Absolutely. Um, there are also scenarios with caregivers where maybe it's the uh, the child taking care of the parent, or perhaps siblings taking care of each other. Um, or maybe an adult taking care of their parent and their kids, but um, adding a traumatic brain injury to the mix can uh, uh, necessarily, like, it, it can change things. But now, are there any organizations that you want to refer people to as far as uh, 
um, whether it's like nonprofits or anything from a traumatic brain injury perspective where they can get more information about resources that are out there? Well, there's the Minnesota Brain Association, Brain Injury Association, I think it okay. is. Okay. Uh, um, and that's the main one. Yeah, and I suppose even just Googling it, you know, whether it's uh, traumatic brain injury, um, nonprofits, that kind of thing can help. Um, also, there are more and more organizations now who are acknowledging this kind of stuff. Um, I think you were the person who, who pointed out to me before the pandemic that um, an orchestra in, uh, I think it's in Minneapolis, but it might be St. Paul, where they have these sensory friendly concerts where they'll they'll do things like dim the lights or or have it where um, things aren't as loud and and just different things where people can still enjoy coming to hear great music, but it's more user friendly, so to speak, for who the audience is. So. Yeah. Amazing Thanks stuff. Thanks for remembering that. No, <laughs> no problem, no problem. So, well, Shelly, thank you so much for, for joining the podcast today. I appreciate it. And I think that uh, whether it's someone with their own traumatic brain injury or perhaps a caregiver who is looking out for them that also needs caregiving themselves, <laughs> this is a great episode to uh, give people a sense of hope and have an idea of just knowing that, you know what, if you are feeling down because of your situation, you know, you're, you're not alone. That, that's, like a, that's a normal thing. But it's also um, very hopeful to know that there are resources that are out there and communities um, to help. So thank you very much. And for those of you well, who are listening, you. oh, go ahead, Shelly. I was going to say, well, thank you, Jen. I just love sharing things with people. And I wanted to put at the end, don't, you know, um, what people would say to me um, from the beginning is, well, it could be so much worse. It could be so much worse. And I was, I, what I would say is, yes, it could be so much worse, but this is bad. Yeah. <laughs> and so okay. not to sit in your situation because um, you need emotional grit to get out, um, but value that, you know, you have to address it to sit in it for a little while and then move on. And because so many people say, well, it's better. It could be worse or, you know, you're doing great or whatever, whatever, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, you have to have time to process it, you know, and and if you're in denial about it and don't want to talk about it or don't want to try to process things, then it can come out sideways, uh, whether it's you dreaming about it or grinding your teeth at night or different things because that stress is is weighing on you. So that's mm -hmm. that's a good point. But all right. Thank well, you then, so much. Sure. Thank you for being here. And to, for those of you who are listening again, please feel free to uh, like and subscribe to the podcast. It's called Emotional Grit and it's on YouTube. And thank you so much for joining us today.